The Warlock's Hairy Heart There was once a handsome, rich, and talented young warlock who observed that his friends grew foolish when they fell in love, gambling and preening, losing their appetites and their dignity. The young warlock resolved never to fall prey to such weakness and employed dark arts to ensure his immunity. Unaware of his secrets, the warlock's family laughed to see him aloof and cold. All will change, they prophesied, when a maid catches his fancy. But the young warlock's fancy remained untouched, though many a maiden was intrigued by his haunting meme and employed her most subtle arts to please him. None succeeded in touching his heart. The warlock gloried in his indifference and the sagacity that had produced it. The first freshness of youth waned and the warlock's peers began to wed, and then to bring forth children. Their hearts must be husks, he sneered inward, as he observed the antics of the young parents around him, shriveled up by the demands of these mewing offspring. And once again, he congratulated himself upon the wisdom of his earlier choice. In due course, the warlock's aged parents died. Their son did not mourn them. On the contrary, he considered himself blessed by their demise. Now he reigned alone in their castle, having transferred his greatest treasure to the deepest dungeons. He gave himself over to a life of ease and plenty. His comfort, the only aim of his ma many servants. The warlock was sure that he must be an object of immense envy to all who beheld his splendid and untouchable solitude. Fierce were his angers in charging therefore. When he overheard two of his lackeys discuss their master, one day, the first servant expressed pity for the warlock, who with all his wealth and power was yet beloved by nobody. But his companions jeered, asking why a man with so much gold and platitude and a palated castle to his name had been unable to attract a wife. Their words dealt dreadful blows to the listening warlock's pride. He resolved at once to take a wife, that she would be a wife superior to all others. She would possess astonishing beauty, exciting envy and desire in every man who beheld her. She would spring from magical lineage, so their offspring would inherit outstanding magical gifts. And she would have wealth as at least equals to his own, so that his comfort existence would be assured in spite of additions to his household. He might have taken the warlock fifty years to find such a woman, yet it so happened that the very day after he decided to seek her, a maiden answered his every wish, arrived in the neighborhood to visit her kinfolks. She was a witch of prodigious skills and possession of much gold. Her beauty was such that it tugged at the heart of every man who set eyes on her, of every man, that is. 
except one. Nevertheless, she was the prize he sought, so he began to pay her court. All who noticed the warlock's change in mannerisms were amazed and told the maiden that she had succeeded where a hundred had failed. The young woman herself was both fascinated and repelled by the warlock's attention. She sensed the coldness that lay behind the warmth of his flattery and had never met a man so strange and remote. Her kinfolks, however, deemed theirs a most suitable match and eager to promote it, accepting the warlock's invitation. The table was laden with silver and gold, bearing the finest wines and the most sumptuous food. Minstrels strummed on silk stringed lutes and sang of love their master had never felt. The maiden sat upon a throne beside the warlock, who spoke, who spake low, employing words of tenderness he had stolen from the poets without any ideas of their true meanings. The maiden listened, puzzled, and finally replied, You speak well, warlock, and I would be delighted by your attentions, if only I thought you had a heart. The warlock smiled and told her that she need not fear on that score, bidding her, bidding her follow, he led her to the feet from the feast and down to the locked dungeon where he kept his greatest treasure. Here in a crystal casket was the warlock's beating heart. Long since discounted from eyes, ears, and fingers, it had never fallen prey to beauty or to a musical voice. To the feel of silken skin, the maiden was terrified by the sight of it, for the heart had shrunken and covered in long black hair. Oh, what have you done? She lamented. Put it back where it belongs, I beseech you! Saying that it was necessary to please her, the warlock drew his wand, unlocking the crystal's casket. Su sliced open his own breast and placed a heart in the empty cavity it had once occupied. Now you are healed and you will know true love, cried the maiden, and she embraced him. The touch of her soft white arms, the sound of her breath in his ear, the scent of her heavy golden hair, all pierced the newly awakened heart like a spear. But it had grown strange during its long exile, blind and savage in the dark so which it had been condemned and its ap appetites had grown powerful and perverse. The guests at the feast had noticed the absence of their host and the maiden at first. Untroubled, they grew anxious as the hours passed and finally began to search the castle. They found the dungeon at last and a most dreadful sight awaited them. The maiden lay dead upon the floor, her breast cut open, and her, beside her crouched the mad warlock, holding in one bloody hand a, a great, smooth, shining scarlet heart, which he licked and stroked, vowing to exchange it for his own. In his other hand, he held his wand, trying to coax from his own heart a shriveled, hairy heart. In the other hand, he held his wand, trying to coax from his own chest the shriveled, hairy heart, but the hairy heart was stronger than he was, 
and refused to relinquish its hold upon his senses or to return to the coffin in which it had been locked for so long. Before the horror-struck eyes of his guest, the warlock cast aside his wand and seized a silver dagger. Vowing never to be mastered by his own heart, he hacked it into his chest. For one moment, the warlock knelt triumphed with a heart clenched in his hand. Then, he fell across the maiden's body and died.